This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. My name is Dustin Smith, and as always, I will be your host. This episode 288, entitled Exploring the Triad in Revelation 1, verses 4 through 5. We're continuing our study, and this will actually be the concluding episode that has been examining the triadic passages in the New Testament, the passages that talk about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're looking desperately to see if they actually make the claim that the God of the Bible actually is three persons rather than one person. And we've looked throughout the New Testament. We've looked in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19. We've also looked at Paul's letters. We've looked through Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians. We've even looked through Ephesians. We looked in Hebrews, 1 Peter. Last week we looked in Jude. We're finally to the end of the New Testament. We're finally at the book of Revelation. Will we finally find evidence that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are actually three distinct persons that make up the one God. We finally find the proof text that demonstrates that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is actually triune rather than unitary in nature. Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is actually looking at the triad in the book of Revelation. Now, you're going to listen to this passage, and you're going to stop and think, wait a minute, did I hear that correctly? But what I'm going to read to you is a passage that some commentators argue refers to the three members of the triune God. We're going to read Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. This is in the greetings section of the letter That is the book of Revelation. So, starting in verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's Revelation 1, verses 4 through 5. So we've got three different subjects here that are sending greetings. We have greetings from him who is and who was and who is to come, the self-existing one at that point, kind of this all-encompassing person who is eternal. He was, he is, and he is to come. And at the end, it's quite clear, we have Jesus Christ, and he's described with three different descriptions. He's the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. But what about the middle referent? The middle referent actually indicates the seven spirits who are before his throne. And some commentators, like G.R. Beasley Murray, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, says that this reference to these seven spirits is not actually seven numerical spirits, but seven functions as the number indicating completion. This means the sevenfold spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. And now we finally have, despite all of the previous letters in the New Testament, a reference to where the Holy Spirit actually sends greetings. Well, many other interpreters are not convinced of that particular interpretation of the reference of the seven spirits who are before his throne. Let's begin by looking at God and Jesus. Remember, we are looking for evidence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and some sort of identification that says that these three are distinct persons that make up the one God. We don't have that sort of equation in our particular passage. But what does it say? Well, God, of course, is the one who is and who was and who is to come. We can also see that he has a throne. 
because it says the seven spirits are before his throne. He is the only one that has a throne. He's the only one who is occupying a particular throne. And of course, the references to the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come, these are all singular references. So this indicates that God is a single person and he is distinct from Jesus Christ and he's distinct from whatever this sevenfold spirit reference is. Let's move on to Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, according to the passage, Jesus is the faithful witness. This noun for witness in Greek is martis, indicating that Jesus is the faithful martyr. I would actually translate it that way. I would indicate that Jesus actually is the faithful martyr. And by describing him as faithful, this, of course, demonstrates that Jesus was faithful to someone else, namely to God. I think the obvious implication is that Jesus was faithful to the one enthroned who is and who was and who is to come. And as a martyr, this, of course, indicates that Jesus died for that which he was speaking. And if Jesus died, this indicates that he was a mortal, someone who could potentially die. He was also raised from the dead, and he's described as the first among many others who are to come. And he's currently ruling over the kings of the earth, demonstrating the realized eschatology of the author of the book of Revelation. And it, of course, indicates his post-resurrection exaltation. So that's what it says about God. That's what it says about Jesus. But we actually don't see a reference here, arguably, to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say the sevenfold spirit. It says the seven spirits. And then it has a plural pronoun, the seven spirits who are before his throne. It's not one spirit. These are seven spirits. And the Holy Spirit throughout Revelation is clearly described as the spirit in every other occurrence. But what does this reference to seven spirits actually mean? Well, later in Revelation, in chapter 8, verse 2, we are told that they are seven angels. The seven angels that John saw who are standing before God. The same sort of reference to the seven spirits that are standing before his throne here in chapter 1, verse 4. And there's other biblical evidence that demonstrates that angels are sometimes called spirits, like at the conclusion of Hebrews chapter 1. So that seems to be a better reading of what this passage is actually indicating. Now, many scholars will actually dub the three primary antagonists in the book of Revelation as the quote-unquote unholy trinity. And these three subjects are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And it's quite clear that this unholy triad are meant to have positive counterparts in the book of Revelation. So these, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, are the dark counterparts to the three positive figures. So if we have a so-called unholy trinity, what are the three holy counterparts? Is this perhaps a reference to the doctrine of the Trinity that is secretly embedded in the book of Revelation? Well, when you read through the book of Revelation, you get the impression that the dragon's counterpart clearly is God, namely the one who is seated on the throne. The beast counterpart is actually the lamb. Both are animals and both are described in ways that play off of one another. And to the surprise of many, the false prophet's counterpart is actually the two witnesses, which is an image reflecting the conquering church's role as faithfully witnessing Jesus' gospel. You can see this in Revelation chapter 11. So we have the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, and then we have the father and the son and the faithful church. My goodness, the poor Holy Spirit got left out of the greetings at the beginning of the letter, and the poor Holy Spirit got left out of the real holy triad that opposes the so-called 
unholy triad. The Holy Spirit is just not doing very well today. So, what can we say confidently about God's use in the Holy Spirit by gathering other evidence from the book of Revelation that will, of course, allow us to place our context passage within its rightful context? This will move us to our second point, point number two, what the book of Revelation teaches about God. So in the opening verse, we get some interesting data on this point. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. This clearly indicates that God and Jesus are distinct figures. Jesus has not been collapsed into the identity of God. And we can see that the resurrected Jesus still has to receive things from God. Even though Jesus is highly exalted, God is empowering and authorizing Jesus with revelatory knowledge. In chapter 1, verse 6, we can see a little bit more. It talks about how he, namely Jesus, has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's Revelation 1, 6. So we can see that God is the God of Jesus and the Father of Jesus. So this indicates that the one who is and who was and who is to come is quite clearly the Father alone. He is Jesus' God, he is Jesus' Father, and that, of course, makes Jesus the Son. And having already indicated that God gives revelatory knowledge to Jesus, we can also see some further indication of the way that God continues to empower the Son. So in chapter 2, verse 26, it says... He who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, that's Jesus' deeds, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also received authority from my Father. That's Revelation 2, 26-27. So what we can see here is that Jesus has received authority from his Father, And now Jesus is going to share that authority with the faithful church, the faithful conquering church. Jesus will give authority over the nations just as he received authority from the Father. So the Father, namely the true God, continues to empower Jesus with revelatory knowledge and with authority over people on the earth. In chapter 4, verse 2, we learn a little bit more. John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. Revelation 4, verse 2. One person is sitting on the throne. Not two persons, not three persons. John saw in his prophetic, trance-like spirit experience, one person sitting on the throne. This is empowered by the Spirit. When he is empowered by the Spirit, He does not see the triune God. He sees one sitting on the throne, meaning one person is in charge. And that, of course, is someone who is described as the creator at the end of that chapter. In chapter 4, verse 11, we see a song that breaks out. Worthy are you, singular reference, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you, singular reference, created all things, and because of your will, they were and were created. That's Revelation 4, verse 11. So we can see that the one seated on the throne is the one person who created all things, not three persons creating all things. And this creation occurred because of his will, namely his desire and his plan. And with this will, they were, and then they were created, indicating that he had a plan and a purpose and then they were created because of that particular plan. But the creator of all things is the one person sitting upon the throne. And at the end of the book of Revelation, we get another indication of the unitary nature of the true God. In chapter 21, verse 3, John says that I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Chapter 21, 
verse 3. So God is described as a he, the singular reference. The people will be his people, another singular reference. And God is described as God himself. Again, a further singular reference. God is a single self, one person. The reference to God himself indicates that this God is only one person. That's what himself actually means. This God cannot be a triune God. So, what do we learn about God? Well, God clearly is a single person, the God and Father of Jesus, the sole creator of all things. So, what about Jesus? What about the Son? This moves us to our third point, point number three, what the book of Revelation teaches about the Son. In chapter 3, verse 2, Jesus talks to the church in Sardis. And he says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Revelation 3, verse 2. Jesus indicates that he has a God. We've already indicated this in several places earlier in the book of Revelation. But here Jesus, on his own lips, continues to indicate that he has a God above him. And then the same letter, just three verses later, he describes who this God is. In chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus says, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So there in the letter to Sardis, Jesus indicates that his God is also his father. The God just is the father. The father just is God. God is a single person, the father alone. And that God is Jesus' God and Jesus' Father. And that, of course, makes Jesus the Son. And if Jesus is the Son of God, then God, by definition, has to be the Father. Jesus openly acknowledges his subordinate position to the God who is above him. And if that wasn't enough, in chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus describes God as his God four times. He says, To him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, he will not go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. Chapter 3, verse 12. Again, it's self-evident. Jesus has a God. The God is, of course, the Father alone. And Jesus has a subordinate position because that God is Jesus' God. Now, what can we say about Jesus himself? Well, in chapter 5, verse 5, one of the elders said to John, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the shoot of David, has conquered so as to open the book and its seven seals. Chapter 5, verse 5. So here Jesus is described as an animal, a ferocious conquering warrior that is a lion, but he's the lion from the tribe of Judah. This is referencing the imagery from Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10, to where the descendant of Judah, who's going to be the human king, from whom David actually came through, this human king is, of course, a lineal biological descendant of Judah. So this is Jesus being described as a descendant of Judah, a king, a ferocious, powerful warrior. And this, of course, makes Jesus a human being. And we can see the second image that's there, the shoot of David, the offshoot of David, David's family tree, and Jesus the offshoot of that. So he's the descendant of David, as the son of David, that is a messianic title, indicating that he is the promised king from David's line, who's going to possess the kingdom and David's throne and the dynasty forever. Both of these references, being the descendant of Judah and the descendant of David, makes Jesus a bona fide member of the human race. He is a man. He's a human being. To be a lineal descendant of Judah means that you're a human being like Judah. To be a lineal descendant of David means that you're a man like David. This is not Jesus as an angel. This is not Jesus as a spirit being. In fact, we've already indicated that Jesus is distinct from the one who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirit angels. 
And if those seven angels are the seven angels described in Judaism as the seven archangels, and that, of course, would distinguish Jesus from even Michael himself. It's another interesting point. Now, Jesus is described here as a lion, but in the next verse, we can see how Jesus conquers, because in chapter 5, verse 6, it says that Jesus is a lamb who is simultaneously standing as if slain. He is a lamb-like figure who is standing up as if he's slain. And the reader is supposed to hold both of those images together in their mind. He is someone who is standing up, having been raised from the dead, but also he's someone who has been slaughtered. He's been slain as a sacrificial lamb. So how did Jesus conquer? He conquered by dying as a sacrificial lamb. And it's this image of the lamb that's going to predominantly dominate the rest of the book of Revelation. The Revelation wants you to know that Jesus is a lamb-like figure, not a conquering warrior figure that uses violence, because Jesus is the one that demonstrates what true conquering actually is. It's not conquering through violent, bloody, powerful means. And in chapter 19, verse 13, is a reference that I really felt we needed to comment on in this particular section. So it's describing Jesus as the rider on the white horse. And it says that he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Chapter 19, verse 13. Now, many people have looked at this and said, look, Jesus is called the Word of God. He is called the Logos to Theu. And they will take that and they will equate it to John chapter 1 and they'll say, in the beginning was the Word. Well, clearly that must be Jesus. But that's not a good reading of the book of Revelation as a whole because in every single other occurrence, the Word of God is not a conscious person. It's the spoken gospel message. It's the spoken testimony that Jesus himself preached. It's Jesus' gospel. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, who we've already seen, is the faithful martyr, meaning that Jesus is the person who died for something that he talked about. What is it that Jesus talked about? His faithful witness. What is his witness? The word of God, the gospel. So, of course, Jesus is going to be given a title that represents the very message that he embodies. Jesus is going to be given this title, the Word of God, namely the Gospel, because that is the message for which he died as a martyr. So this is not a reference to the Logos as the pre-existing personified speech in the Gospel of John. This is a reference to the Word of God that's been defined as the spoken Gospel message, the good news of the kingdom, earlier in the book of Revelation, even as early as the first two verses of Revelation chapter 1. So enough about God, enough about Jesus. What does the book of Revelation say about the Spirit? This is our fourth point, what Revelation teaches about the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, verse 10, John tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and in this prophetic experience, he witnessed many things. He heard behind him the loud voice that was like the sound of a trumpet, chapter 1, verse 10. But he was in the spirit. He was in the sphere of this trance-like prophetic experience. And that is how he receives many of these revelatory images. Now, the spirit also functions as communicating to the seven churches in Asia Minor the will of God. So in chapter 2, verse 7, for example, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit also functions as the extended presence of God that gives instructions to the churches directly from God himself. The Spirit, in that sense, is going to speak to the churches. Chapter 17, verse 3, we see a little bit more of the prophetic spirit that gives the experience of the trance-like visionary activity to John the seer. 
it says that he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. This is an angel. The angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And what did he see? He saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And so this is part of his visionary experience, but he's taken to this barren wilderness to see this terrible, awful woman who is sitting on a beast. And this beast is not the beast that we've come to know and understand and appreciate, namely the lamb. This is an awful beast. Now we can see the counterpart of that image in chapter 21, verse 10, where the angel carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, presently coming down out of heaven from God. So on one hand, we have the spirit showing a terrible image of a nasty, adulterous woman. And that image occurred in the desolate wilderness. But on the other hand, we see the other side, the flip side of the coin, the spirit taking John to a great and high mountain where people typically encounter God and God's revelatory messages. And what does he see? He sees the New Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven. And then at the end, we have this final request from the Spirit to the readers of the book of Revelation, this last summons and this last call to heed the message that's written therein. So in chapter 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Chapter 22, verse 17. So the bride, the bride of Christ, that's the church. The church is encouraging the reader to come and to take part of New Jerusalem. And even the one who hears is also supposed to go out and to speak forth this message and to say, come. But the Spirit also is doing this because the Spirit, as we've seen earlier in chapter 2, verse 7, is communicating to the churches and encouraging the churches to conquer and to do what they're supposed to do. So that's what Revelation says about the Spirit. So in conclusion, we have learned that God is the God of Jesus. God sits on the throne. He's the sole creator of all things. He is defined as the Father alone, namely Jesus' Father. God has empowered Jesus by giving Jesus the revelation, by exalting Jesus to heaven, and by giving Jesus authority over the nations. We also observe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the faithful witness. And he's the one who showed faithfulness to God. And he showed the readers what faithfulness actually looks like. He died for his testimony and God raised Jesus from the dead. God also exalted Jesus to be the ruler of the kings of the earth. As the Messiah, Jesus is the lineal and biological descendant of Judah and of King David. And as a faithful witness, Jesus' gospel message, that is the word of God, comes to be used as a descriptive title. We also observe that the Holy Spirit is the prophetic power that engages John the Revelator in the visionary experience. The Spirit sends no greetings. The Spirit is not gathered into any triad along with the Father and the Son. And the Spirit never occupies a position of authority like a throne. The Spirit does, however, echo the will of God by summoning the reader to listen and to come take part of New Jerusalem that is coming down out of heaven. So in conclusion, Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 through 5 is not, on close examination, a reference to the triune God, a reference to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. On the contrary, Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 through 5 distinguishes the true God from Jesus, and it actually is a biblical Unitarian text. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Join us next week as we begin a brand new series. I'm very excited about this. Our new series is going to examine the phrase, I am he, and what this phrase meant in the Old Testament and in Judaism, and also what it meant on the mouth of Jesus. Too often, people accuse Jesus of claiming to be the I am in a manner that suggests that he is identifying himself with 
the person of Yahweh, particularly in the Gospel of John. Our new series will look at all the data to see what the phrase actually meant and what Jesus himself was actually doing with that particular phrase. You won't want to miss this exciting series. Please look forward to our next episode. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us as we promote the sound, non-negotiable truths about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. You can support us absolutely for free by subscribing online, by giving us an honest review on iTunes, and by sharing your favorite episode with your friends. If you'd like to offer a donation, please check out the episode's description for a link to PayPal or use the join function on the YouTube channel. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please take care.